Hello and welcome to Car News Weekly with me, your host, Billy Carswell. Now, this is the third one, so I'm kind of getting to grips with the format a little bit, but you are going to have to bear with me with the hideous lighting and this hideous background. I'll try and sort it out a bit once I get some money. But anyway, from the world's first minivan to the new Audi RS6 Avant, let's get on with week three. First up is news that Hyundai is set to be launching a limited edition version of their i30N called the Project C. Now it's going to be called the Project C as it is named after Area C, which is a part of their high performance testing facility at their centre in Korea. It's set to be a lighter, lower, more corner slicing version of the i30N. I've not made up corner slicing version, that is straight from the press release. So to that end you'll find some aerodynamic tweaks. Most noticeably, they are around the front with a lower, more pronounced splitter. You'd also get a set of 19-inch motorsport-inspired alloys, as well as some carbon fibre reinforced plastic used somewhere within the car. There isn't an awful lot of details, to be honest, but like I say, it's just going to be lighter than the standard car, so you'd expect it's going to be better to drive, perhaps. Um, I'm a big fan of the normal i30N, so it's nice to see Hyundai doing something else with the car. 600 will be made, but unfortunately, it doesn't look like they're going to be coming to this country, as they are all going to be left hand drive. Yeah, a bit of a shame, but like I say, I like the car, so I thought I'd give it a mention. Right now, we've got arguably the biggest news story of the week, and that is about the new RS6 Avant. What a car, I absolutely love it. Now, it's a big, a big bit of news for multiple reasons. Firstly, the RS6 is always a corker. Secondly, it is the first time this car will be available in North America. And thirdly, like I've kind of just hinted to, I absolutely love the, um, the RS6. Uh, my dad would be able to tell you just how much I like it. I've absolutely adored the previous generation for years. Anyway, what about some actual statistics and information? Well, with the exception of the front doors, the roof and the tailgate, which is also known as the boot for us over in this country, all of the exterior parts for the new RS6 are completely new and different to those you'll find on the normal A6. Quite cool. This one is fitted with a 4-litre twin-turbo V8 and that produces 600 PS, which is 592 brake horsepower. You also get 800 newton meters of torque, and that means this car, which weighs over two tons, can do 0 to 62 miles an hour in 3.6 seconds. Pretty mad, and the top speed is limited to 155. Now, there's a bit of a disclaimer on that top speed because if you get the dynamic package, it will be raised to 174, and if you get the dynamic package plus, it will be raised to 190. I don't really understand why you have to buy packages to get the top speed, uh, the actual top speed, but I guess Audi need to make some money. Now, obviously, this car comes with their Quattro system, and unlike in other big sort of fast saloon cars like the M5 and the E63S, they've stuck to their Audi guns, and you can't switch into two-wheel drive only. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, under normal circumstances, power is split 40 to the front, 60 to the rear, but that can go up to 70% of the power to the front and up to 85% to the rear. With it being 2019, obviously, you have some technology to try and save fuel, although I don't imagine many people in RS6 are going to be bothered about that. So to that end, you get a mild 48 volt hybrid system, which you've probably heard of in other VARG products. That helps store energy when the car is coasting and allows for the activation of start-stop at speeds of up to 13 miles an hour. You've also got cylinder deactivation, and that means the car can run on four cylinders when appropriate. Now, as you'd expect on the inside, this car is packed to the hilt with technology, and I'm not going to go through everything because I haven't got time this is already quite a long piece but you do now have some RS mode buttons so you can kind of pre-program your favorite settings for the car and access them with one button and there's also an RS monitor which displays various pieces of information about the car yeah like I said at the top of this story I love the RS6 so I'm glad to see it's back and I'm glad to see that it's as mean as ever now this story is kind of a bonus one which I've included because I saw the press release and I just absolutely loved the car. So this is news that the world's first minivan is set to be on display at the Concourse of Elegance in September. So just look at this thing, it is immense. You can see hopefully why I decided to include it. So what is it? Well it's a 1936 Stout Scarab and it is one of only nine in existence. This artwork, artwork, oh, art deco work of art, sorry, is a brainchild of somebody called William Bushnell Stout, who took inspiration from somebody called Buckminster Fuller. They're both fantastic names, and yeah, this thing is just stunning. I love the look of it. Perhaps more interestingly, um, to sort of petrol heads, I guess, is that this is powered by a V8 engine that is positioned in the back of the car, kind of like a precursor to the 911 or Beetle. I doubt it, but cool nevertheless and one of the reasons perhaps this car didn't take off and they only made nine is because it was sort of handcrafted and it was very expensive to make 
So it was $5,000 at the time, which is almost $100,000 in new money. But yeah, I love it. And unlike most new cars, you can actually describe this thing as beautiful and elegant. Certainly a much better option than the sort of MPVs they make these days. It just looks amazing. Yeah, just had to include it. Right, now we have news that Porsche have unveiled the interior, or at least the dashboard, of the new Porsche Taycan. I think that's how you pronounce it. This is their fully electric car that's set to be fully revealed at Frankfurt. I think that'll be next month, and it's quite a major car, so I figured I'd include this because, yeah, people are interested to know what the inside of, or at least the dash, is going to look like. So what do we learn from these pictures? Well, firstly, it is distinctly Porsche. That is perhaps not hard to believe because it is a Porsche after all and they have took inspiration from the original 1963 911. Now you can get up to four screens, yeah that's right, four screens. Uh, yeah, it's getting a bit, a bit ridiculous really but we'll start with the instrument cluster, so that's the one in front of the driver and that is a 16.8 inch curved display and I believe this is the first Porsche to not have any analogue dials even in the sort of latest generation 911. All of the sort of screens and that are there but you've still got an analog rev counter and in this you don't it is a completely dis uh, digital display on either side of this display there are some touch control sections so you'll be able to do the lights via touch control as well as some of the chassis settings moving into the middle you've obviously got the big multimedia interface screen which is where you control all of the car's functions as well as your sort of phone your nav and your media I'm not going to go into details because yeah like i say it just controls everything really interestingly though you can then get that screen sort of mirrored with a third display which is in front of the passenger. Now I'm not really sure if this is a good idea or not, um, they say it's so the passenger can sort of do things instead of the driver doing it and stop them from being distracted, but I imagine it's going to be quite annoying very easily because if you've got a passenger for example who doesn't know how to set the sat nav or do the thing you want to do in the system, you're either going to do it for them or end up trying to explain it to them whilst you're driving. Now the fourth and final screen is an 8.4 inch screen that you'll find lower down in the dash and this is where you'll control things like the air conditioning. Not really sure why they've got rid of actual buttons and sort of dials for your aircon but as is the way apparently in 2019 you have a screen for that instead. Yeah, as you imagine it all looks very swish and I'm sure it's all going to be fairly crisp and responsive. Right, to round this week up we have news that Vauxhall's sister company Opel are going to be the first manufacturers to produce a fully electric rally car. Now quite obviously from these pictures you can see this rally car is going to be based on the Vauxhall Corsa E which is the fully electric version of the Vauxhall Corsa which was revealed back in May. I believe they're now taking deposits on those sort of normal road cars. Now this Corsa E rally is set to compete in the ADAC Opel E rally cup. Yeah that rolls off the tongue and it's planned there's going to be 15 of those competing in the next season. Obviously now this isn't going to be for the big boy rally people. This is for sort of for those getting into the sport for younger drivers. So to that end, these cars are going to cost less than forty-six thousand pounds. The car will produce a hundred kilowatts, uh, and which is around one hundred and thirty horsepower and two hundred and sixty newton meters of torque. Yeah, quite like this one. Um, obviously, it remains to be seen how good rallying is as a sort of spectacle without the sort of sound of high revving engines. But for the sort of reliability and durability testing for electric cars, it makes sense, I imagine, to do this because electric cars and rallying aren't necessarily two things you put together. So it'd be good to see how tough they are. Yeah, just a little one to round off this week. I've tried to maybe make it a little bit briefer than the last one because, I don't know, 11 minutes seems quite long. But with me rambling, it's now going to push the time up. So I will try and wrap up. If you could please comment about any of these stories and like and subscribe or just one of those things, it would really help this channel. Uh, sort of grow and obviously I want this to grow as much as possible. So yeah, I've been Blee, thank you for watching and please subscribe.